Uh, welcome to this panel on uh, Teach for America. My name is Chris Lubianski. I'm a professor in education policy, and I'm also the director of the Forum on the Future of Public Education, which is an um, entity here at the university which is intended to, to raise the level of discussions on uh, some topics in education policy, such as Teach for America. So we're quite pleased to be hosting this panel today. Uh, this panel, I should point out, was organized largely by uh, Jameson Brewer and then with, with great assistance from Tiffany Puckett in the back of the room, so we can thank them for um, all their efforts around this. Uh, most of you, I'm guessing, are somewhat familiar with, with Teach for America. Um, it goes back about 15 years when Wendy Kopp famously wrote a, um, a, a senior thesis at Princeton outlining the ideas that became Teach for America and the following year working with, um, with other partners such as Whitney Tilson uh, and some others. Uh, launched this effort, which has really become a major fixture in the um, education reform landscape in the United States and elsewhere in other countries as well now. Uh, and it's also increasingly becoming a, um, a player in education policy making as well. Uh, it's obviously had a major impact um, in, in many areas. Uh, there's some research on that, which I think some of the panelists will get into as far as uh, the classroom level impact. And there is some controversy around that, things like the, the preparation that the, um, that the Teach for America recruits go through uh, before they enter the classroom. And there's also some questions that have been raised about the wider systemic impact of Teach for America on, on public education in the US, to the point that there's been a movement in so, on some campuses where faculty members are refusing to write letters for people that are applying for Teach for America. So there's obviously some, some discussion to be had around some of the issues that are raised by Teach for America. Um, so we're going to hear from four panelists today about uh, Teach for America. Um, and I, we had a fifth panelist who's not able to be here because of uh, family medical reasons. So I apologize for that. But that gives all of our panelists a little bit of extra time uh, to speak today. Um, so uh, to introduce them briefly, um, we're going to have uh, Josh Anderson um, speak. He grew up in Chicago and went to college at Princeton, where he graduated summa cum laude with a BA in, from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, Josh joined TFA in 2004 as a New York City Corps member. He taught middle school English and studies, uh, social studies in the Hunts Point community of the Southeast Bronx and served as team member for a 15-member Teach for America cohort at a school. Josh then joined TFA's staff as recruitment director for the Midwest recruitment team and was appointed executive director of TFA Chicago in February of 2007. During his tenure, the region has grown in its core from 120 to 600, and its alumni teacher base from 100 to 850, and its number of alumni principals from 8 to 63. So we're really looking forward to hearing from, from Josh. Um, next, we have Stephanie Saclarides. Um, Stephanie joined TFA in Phoenix as a core member after graduating from Vanderbilt in 2007. She stayed in her placement district for six years. Uh, she's taught sixth grade for four years and then seventh and eighth grade mathematics for one year. She spent one year as an instructional coach where she observed and evaluated teachers, co-planned, modeled, and co-taught lessons with teachers and planned and implemented weekly professional develop development based on student and teacher needs. Stephanie spent two years as her district's summer school administrator where she worked collabor collaboratively with her district. Teach for America and Arizona State University to plan and oversee the summer school program, serving over 500 students each summer. Stephanie's received two master's degrees from Arizona State, her first in elementary ed and her second in educational administration and supervision. And she's currently working on her PhD here in mathematics education and curriculum instruction department. I hear you have a great advisor too. <laughs> um, then we'll hear from, <coughs> sorry, Katie Osgood. Katie is an educator who currently teaches in a psychiatric hospital in Chicago, and she was a special educator, education teacher in the Chicago public schools and is also taught in Japan. She holds a master's degree from DePaul University in Chicago in special and elementary education, and she's currently a PhD student at UIC in education policy. Um, she maintains a very popular blog and has authored numerous pieces on Teach for America that appeared in Education Week and at the Chalk Face which is an online blog. And finally, uh, Jameson Brewer. He's an associate director for the Forum on the Future of Public Education and a PhD student here at the University of Illinois in Education Policy Studies, where he studies Teach for America and other privatization reform movements in public education. He is a traditionally trained and certified educator who was forced to join TFA 
to find a job during the height of the recession. He taught high school history in the Atlanta public schools and holds a bachelor's degree in secondary education of history from Valdosta State University and a master's degree in social foundations of education from Georgia State. He has published articles on TFA in peer-reviewed journals of educational studies and critical education, while also publishing articles in the Progressive Magazine and Education Week. A forthcoming book chapter entitled Teach for America, the Neoliberal Alternative to Teacher Professionalism will be in print later this year. So those are our four panelists. Um, they're each going to speak for about 12 minutes, and I'll keep time and give you signals as, as we proceed. Um, and then after they each get a, a chance to speak, um, we're going to give them an uh, opportunity to raise questions to each other. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll reserve the first part of the discussion just for the panelists. But during that time, I encourage you to write down any questions that you might have, put those on a piece of paper, and then we'll collect those, and, um, and, and we'll have a chance for your questions to be um, presented to the, to the panelists as well. So uh, without any further um, preparations, let's uh, turn it over to Josh. Would you like to start? Great. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Terrific. OK, so my name is Josh Anderson. I serve as the executive director of Teach for America in the Chicago region. Uh, just quickly, a little bit about me. I grew up in the Chicago area. Um, an important family background. My mom was a teacher for 40 years. Um, and my dad was a teacher union organizer. Um, and actually led the Illinois Education Association uh, for a number of years uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s. Um, I got into education through Teach for America as a teacher um, and uh, had a very, very powerful, very challenging and deeply inspiring experience. Um, and um, I will say teaching my fifth and sixth grade students is what got me hooked on this work as I realized uh, that the level of education they had been receiving uh, was absolutely not OK. Um, they had all the ability in the world so they could excel if given the right opportunities. Um, and I walked away from the experience just deeply convinced that this was a solvable problem. Um, and so uh, by the end of my second year in the classroom, was either going to keep teaching or try to work for an education reform organization. I am a Chicagoan. I wanted to get back to the Chicago area, and so started working for Teach for America starting in 2006, and have been our executive director here now for about eight years. Um, so, and I will just also say I'm, I'm excited for this conversation. Um, obviously, there will be some critical questions raised about Teach for America's role, um, and I'm excited to talk about that. Um, so thanks for making the time, and thanks to the other panelists for raising uh, tough questions and important questions. So I'll start with uh, a simple question, which is just that often gets overlooked, which is what is the purpose of public education? Um, I'll give you my answer, which is I got into this because I believe the purpose of public education is to set children up for a life of empowered citizenship um, in a complex, fast-moving democratic society. The purpose of education is to empower by teaching critical thinking. So how are we doing against this purpose? Um, and I'm going to focus a lot of my comments on Chicago, because uh, that's the context I know best. Um, and uh, the short answer is we're not doing so well. Uh, it's actually kind of alarming how poorly we are doing. Um, and so here are some, uh, some facts about where we are in Chicago. Um, Chicago Public Schools has about 400,000 students in it. Uh, about 340,000 of those 400,000 kids come from low-income backgrounds. Um, if you are a child growing up on the south, southwest, or west side of the city of Chicago, uh, which likely means you are coming from a low-income background, um, by the time you reach fourth grade, you're generally two to three grade levels behind your more affluent peers growing up on the north side of the city or in a, a wealthy suburb. By the time you reach eighth grade, you're four to five grade levels behind. By the time you reach 12th grade, about half of our students have dropped out. Um, now, overall, our system graduation rate uh, is over 60%. But when you zoom in on our low-income children, the graduation rate drops a bit. Um, and so it is not atypical to see graduation rates between 35 uh, and 45% in our high schools serving low-income students. Um, I think the scariest statistic, uh, two of the scariest statistics th at this point in time is uh, the kids who do graduate uh, from high school from low-income backgrounds uh, generally read and do math at an eighth grade level. Um, and these are the kids who basically have met our expectations and they leave our system reading and doing math at an eighth grade level. And uh, for kids from a low-income background in the city of Chicago today, they have an 8% chance of going to and graduating from a four-year college by the age of 25. Think about that for a second. An 8% chance of going to and graduating from a four-year college by the age of 25. And think about what an essential gateway to opportunity college education is today. Um, and, see, and think about how alarming it is that the vast majority of our students aren't getting that opportunity. 
I share all that because uh, it paints the, the picture of, one, we've got a, a moral problem, which is we're not delivering on the promise of equal opportunity for kids coming from low-income backgrounds. We've got a political problem, which is that we're not uh, tending to the future of our democracy by setting kids up to thrive and navigate within a complex society. And third, we're undermining the lifeblood, the future viability and competitiveness of our city, of our country, by not educating uh, this core group of students. Uh, it is just a profoundly unstrategic thing to do. Um, so there are moral, political, and very practical reasons why we should all care a whole lot about this. Um, the good news in this whole equation, um, and I think uh, basically anyone who's spent time in a classroom will tell you this, um, the problem isn't our students. Our, problems have, our, our kids have all the ability they need in the world. And there are countless great examples now in the form of dozens of schools and literally more than a thousand classrooms in the city of Chicago where kids are making growth that doubles or triples uh, the system average uh, and where kids are going to and through college as the normal outcome versus the outlier outcome. So we know that when we give our students the opportunities they deserve, they thrive and excel. So not only do we have a massive and urgent problem on the one hand, we know that it's solvable. And that's not to minimize things that are out happening outside of school, it's just to prove a simple point, which is that when we give kids the educational opportunities they deserve, education can be the thing that changes a person's life trajectory. So what's Teach for America's role within this equation? Um, we have a simple role, which is uh, we are a leadership development organization. Uh, so we aim to attract, support, develop great, diverse talent for the leadership talent for the fight for educational equity and excellence. How do we do that? We start uh, by recruiting uh, and selecting uh, what we call core members at colleges and university campuses and in young professional markets around the country. Um, in a normal year now, we'll see about 50,000 applications, and then we have a very selective screening process. Uh, we've done a set of regression analyses using student achievement data over the last decade plus uh, to basically say, what is it at the admission stage that predicts success once you're in the classroom? And that's how we go from an applicant pool of about 50,000 to about 6,000 new core members every year. So it's a very selective process. I also want to note uh, our core um, is actually increasingly diverse, and that is essential given the work we do. Given that 99% of the students we serve, for example, in the city of Chicago are African American or Latino, it is essential that our, uh, that our teachers more and more reflect their background. So let me give you a couple stats on that. Uh, at this point in time, 36% of our new teachers in the city of, of our of core members coming into Chicago identify as people of color. And I think a really powerful statistic, and probably right to the point of this, is 25% of our incoming core members are first generation college graduates in their family. Um, so we recruit and select, so we bring this talent force in. The second thing we do then is prepare and support new teachers. Uh, so everyone may be familiar with the relatively short but intensive training experience core members get over the course of the summer before they start teaching. Um, and then I do want to highlight something really important, which is unlike almost any other preparation program, we stay with our teachers through their first two years in the classroom. So we have about 600 first and second year teachers in the city of Chicago, and for every 18 of them, there's a full-time staff member on my team called a manager of, of teacher leadership development. It's a terrible, long, unwieldy title. Uh, but basically what they are is a full-time coach uh, devoted to their 18 core members. Uh, and they're in their classroom every two weeks or so, uh, giving them real-time feedback on how they're doing. Uh, so that we make sure that our teachers are learning and developing because we believe that essential learning, and I don't think anyone would agree with, uh, disagree with this, essential learning happens once you're in the classroom. And if we can be there to provide a mirror and to be a coach to help you get up that learning curve faster, that's going to be immensely important. Um, in terms of the preparation and ongoing support, um, I just want to say a really simple thing, which is I think what we should focus most on is we can, we can talk about all the different inputs from how you admit to how you prepare to how you support. But what matters ultimately in this equation is how do the kids do in the classrooms? Um, and so I'm going to again talk about the Chicago data. We've worked really hard over the last eight plus years to make sure that we have reliable, valid, rigorous, and benchmarkable student achievement data for our teachers' classrooms. So what that means is the vast majority of our teachers either use an elementary level assessment called NWEA or a high school assessment called ACT, which you're probably familiar with. Um, 
And basically what you see when you look at the 600 core members classrooms in the city of Chicago is our students, I mean our teachers lead their students to an average of 1.5 to 2 years worth of progress in the course of a normal school year, which is basically doubling uh, the typical rate of growth you're seeing in, uh, across the system. So we can fixate on the inputs, but the critical thing to know is um, we see very promising evidence about the teacher impact. Um, the last thing I'll share is so, um, the last thing I'll share about our model is so we, we start by recruiting and selecting, then we train and prepare new teachers. And then the final thing we do is support, try to accelerate and clarify the pathway to leadership for our alumni. Because uh, the idea of Teach for America in the long term is that uh, people will come in and be transformed, uh, be sort of totally galvanized by this experience of meeting and working closely with their students so that they become lifelong leaders and advocates for fundamental change in education. Um, and so here's what you see. Um, we basically see that uh, in a normal year now, 65 plus percent of our second year core members stay in the classroom for a third year in Chicago. Um, we see that 70% uh, of our total alumni base are working, uh, and this is again Chicago, that's what I'm, ta I'm talking about, the context I know. 70% uh, of our total alumni are working full time in education. Um, and what that has led to is the following. As I said earlier, we have 850 alumni who are still teaching. Uh, we have now 63 of our alumni in the city of Chicago who have become principals. Um, and we have nearly 100 more folks who are assistant principals and deans. Um, on top of that, we have a couple hundred people who are working full-time in education, as I s said, but not necessarily in a school-based context. So they're working in this growing ecosystem of education reform nonprofits, advocating for supporting schools to get better. Um, so that's a, a short window into what we do. Um, I just want to say two further things, which is um, uh, I think it's always good to sort of uh, show and sort of reflect on what you hear as criticisms or critiques. Um, and so two, the two most frequent critiques, critiques or criticisms of Teach for America you hear are the inadequacy of the preparation um, and the lack of retention of the alumni. Um, and so I just want to bring you back or sort of pull out some key data points in what I just shared. Um, we can talk as much as we want about how short the training is, but there are three complex things going on that are leading to pretty good student achievement outcomes. One, we are highly rigorous and selective in the teacher selection process. Two, we're providing highly intensive and relevant training for your early days in the classroom. And then three, which people never talk about, we provide highly intensive support to our first and second year teachers once they're in the classroom. Thank you. Um, and what that leads to, again, is really promising student achievement outcomes. Again, locally, the NWA and ACT data. Um, and uh, nationally, sort of, you see, um, sort of, for example, the most recent Mathematica study uh, showing that you know core members teaching math were leading their students to an additional two, two to three months of, in, uh, of learning growth in the course of a normal year. Uh, but again, I'm going to keep us to the Chicago context because that's what I sort of oversee and know best. The second uh, critique of round uh, alumni retention, which is you know basically the way you usually hear it, is, boy, Teach for America, that could be an interesting idea, but then they leave. Uh, it's two years and out. They're trained to be and set up to be short timers. Um, and again, that's not what we're seeing. Um, it's really important and it's absolutely the purpose uh, that 70% of our alumni are making their careers in education in Chicago. That's exactly what we intend and what we want to be happening because we want our people to become lifelong leaders and advocates for fundamental change in education. Um, and again, you've got this growing teacher base of 850. The average tenure of those teachers is five years. Uh, and then this growing group going into administration after five, six, seven years in the classroom, gaining an administrative certificate um, and going on to lead their own schools. Um, so I will stop there. Uh, I'm sure there will be lots of great questions throughout. Um, I hope that's helpful just to sort of set the context and explain some baseline facts about what we do. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> My turn. Yay. Okay, so um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, so I'd like to start by just telling you, um, providing you all with more information, more details about my experience in Phoenix. Um, so first I'd like to tell you about some of the ongoing projects I had in my district, which I'm you know, still very excited about. Um, I started a composting program um, in a community garden at my placement school. So families from the community could come in, they could plant um, fruits and vegetables, um, and then harvest them and eat them at home. 
I coach numerous sports. Um, middle school cheerleading was an experience for me. Um, I organized school-wide talent shows and spelling bees. Um, I entered teams of students um, over the course of six years into math and science competitions at ASU. Um, I was recognized for my district for having out student, um, outstanding student growth. Um, I received um, an important award from my district, the You Make a Difference Award. I received a teaching award from Teach for America. Um, I also hosted numerous interns and student teachers over the course of six years. Um, and I, I bring this up um, to stress that none of this would have been possible if it weren't for the ongoing support that I received um, from my school district, but also from Teach for America. And that's what I want to spend some time talking about right now. So as you heard from the bio, I was placed in Phoenix, Arizona um, in a self-contained sixth grade classroom. So I had the same group of students all day long, um, and I taught every subject. So math, reading, writing, grammar, science, social studies, everything. Um, and uh, the year that I was placed in Phoenix, there were two other core members who were placed at my school, as well as um, nine core members across my small district of six schools. Um, so. So again, I want to spend some time talking about the support um, that I received that helped me do um, those things that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so I had all of the support that I could have asked for and wanted in my district. So first, thinking about the school team that I was placed on, um, on my sixth grade team, there was a very strong veteran teacher who served as like the anchor for, for my team. And she welcomed me. Um, she was also Greek. Maybe that helped. Um, but she welcomed me with open arms. Um, and I would lesson plan with her. I would go to her and say, you know, I'm, I'm having this difficult situation with a student. What can I do to, to make things better? Um, I would, around parent-teacher conference time, I would ask her, you know, how do you, how do, you do parent-teacher conferences? What is your format? And so she, she's somebody who I stayed in very close contact with for my six years and even, and even now. So having that very strong mentor on my team, that anchor, um, was definitely very helpful. So moving beyond um, this mentor teacher, my school had something called curriculum peer teachers, CPTs, that were essentially instructional coaches. And they would come and meet with my team once a week, um, show us instructional strategies that we could turn around and implement in the classroom. Um, if I wanted, they could come in and model a lesson, um, co-teach a lesson with me, again, so that I could learn and develop and grow as an educator in this profession. Um, and then beyond that, there was tons of support from my administration in Phoenix. I distinctly remember at one point sitting down with, I think, the head of assessment, whose background was in mathematics, um, mathematics and having a discussion with her about, you know, how can we conceptually teach students um, why the standard algorithm for dividing fractions makes sense, um, and turning around and teaching that to students. So, so again, I had a ton of support in my district. On top of that, I was very well supported by Teach for America. So in my day, and I, I realize they've changed um, the name for it, um, we had program directors who were essentially assigned to core members who were responsible for our professional development and ongoing learning. I had two different um, PDs in my first and second year, and, and they were just outstanding, intelligent, um, amazing individuals who, who really helped me. I remember, again, sitting in different coffee shops in Phoenix on the weekends, um, lesson planning with these individuals, creating rubrics with them, um, discussing how I would roll out a writer's workshop in my classroom. Um, so having that one-on-one -on -one support. If I wanted them to come and observe me teach, um, teach something to receive critical feedback um, that I could turn around and, and, and use to, again, improve my instruction and my practice, you know, they were in my classroom and ready to help. Um, and on top of that, over the course of my two years, um, Teach for America offered numerous professional development opportunities, um, and I attended many of them, and, and I still remember them vividly, and, and leaving these, these sessions and thinking, wow, that was really helpful. I can turn around, implement this in my classroom, um, and, and just f finding them to be very, very useful. Um, so, so again, I, just, I felt very, very much supported in my district. Um, between between my district and Teach for America, um, so as as you know, I stayed for six years. So clearly, after after my two years or during my two years, I fell in love with my school community, um, the teachers on my team, the teachers across my school, um, across the district administration, um, my students, families, the community, and of course, it wasn't um, it wasn't even a decision of whether or not I would stay. I couldn't picture myself doing anything else that would make me feel so happy and fulfilled. Um, so so of course, I stayed. 
So I'd like to tell you kind of a little bit about more about what happened um, and as I call it my tour of the district um, after my two years. So I stayed in my placement um, for, uh, for three years. I did sixth grade self-contained. Um, at the end of my third year, there, there's one middle school in my district and they had an opening for seventh and eighth grade mathematics. In Phoenix, um, seventh and eighth grade math positions are extremely hard to fill. Um, and so I had my middle school math endorsement and I agreed to just um, to move up and to teach seventh and eighth grade math, which was nice because I got to loop with some of my students. Um, and so I taught seventh and eighth grade math for one year. Um, at the end of my fourth year, um, one of the elementary schools in my district wanted to kind of experiment with the idea of departmentalizing their sixth grade team. So instead of having one teacher teach everything, all of that really beefy, meaty content at the sixth grade level, um, saying, you know, one teacher will do six, one teacher will do math, reading, so on and so forth. So I moved down, I helped spearhead this departmentalization. Um, I taught sixth grade math only, and I um, served as a mentor for teachers in grades four through six. At the end of my fifth year, I learned about this opening at another school in my district um, for an instructional coach position. Um, at the time, I was working on my second master's in administration and supervision. Um, and I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity. Um, so I applied, I interviewed, and I was very excited to accept the position. Um, and, and part of my excitement was, again, thinking back to that initial support that I received as a beginning teacher from my district and also from Teach for America, and wanting to provide that same type of intensive, ongoing support for other teachers to help them improve their practice. So, so that really just molded my conception of the role. Um, Let's see, what else do I have to share with you? Um, so past my two-year commitment to Teach for America, I did maintain um, close ties with the organization. In my third and fourth year, I um, ran professional development for first and second year core members. Um, but I would say the, the most continued contact I had with Teach for America was through my experiences as my district summer school administrator. So my, districts had, my district had a long-standing summer school program that was seen to be an extension of the regular school year. Um, and the first year that I um, took on the role of summer school principal or administrator was the first year that my district partnered with Teach for America to um, host one of their institute training sites. And so I coordinated, it was, it was a blast. I coordinated between Teach for America um, as we hosted about, I want to say 80 core members, um, between ASU, as we also hosted one of their, teach, um, their teaching preparation programs, um, AmeriCorps, we had AmeriCorps volunteers on our campus, as well as pretty much every department on, um, on my campus, curriculum, English language acquisition, um, nutrition, health, transportation, um, everything to get this program organized, up and running, and then overseeing it. And I'm very proud we, um, we served uh, 500 students every summer that I was um, involved. So, so again, I share um, my, my unique experience with you all to just paint a better picture of the support that I received, again, from my district and Teach for America, um, and to just explain that I am very grateful for that and helped mold, mold me into the educator that I am today. Um, at the end, to kind of explain, well, gosh, how, how did you end up here? Um, so at the end of my, my six years, I decided that the best way to be a better resource for a Title I district um, and my students and families in the community was to continue my education by pursuing my um, doctoral degree. So, at, so the plan as of now, and we all know things change, but is to return after my program to a Title I district and serve once again in the role of an instructional coach or a principal um, or a district level administrator. Before we go on to the second half of our panel, if you do have questions, please write them down. And if you just pass them to the outside of the rows, we'll pick them up and, um, and, and collect them that way. And secondly, there are, um, there, there's coffee and um, some snacks in the back of the room, so please feel free to help yourself. Uh, please. Hi. Good morning. Are you guys all awake? I know it's Monday morning on college campus. So, um, Can you guys hear me okay? Um, actually, I'm really excited to be here. I am a U of I alum. I graduated from this school back in 2000, so I'm pretty excited to be back on campus. I L L, yay! Okay, um, uh, I had a lot of friends that were in the School of Education here. Um, how many of you guys are in the School of Ed? Okay, yeah. So I remember just like them disappearing for most of senior year as they went into student teaching and just never seeing them. Um, a lot of them are still out there teaching, as far as I know, though. Um, I wanted to give a little background on why I'm here to speak out against. Um, teach for America. Um, because on the surface, TFA sounds like a really nice idea. What's wrong with putting hardworking young people in our classrooms, right? Um, I'm currently a special education teacher in Chicago. I currently teach at a psychiatric facility. So um, I'm working with kids who are in crisis, kids who are um, 
suffering from pretty significant mental health problems, um, disabilities, uh, and a vast majority of our students are coming um, from poverty. They are um, also, a lot of our kids are also um, uh, children of color. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that is causing um, them to come to a psych hospital. Um, number one reason is what's happening out there in our communities. Um, from, uh, so we get a lot of kids that are just, have experienced pretty significant trauma in their lives. Um, I have a lot of contacts in the Chicago Public Schools and I cannot tell you one teacher out there who I have not had at least one of their students in my hospital. And I, we're not a very big hospital. So I wanna give you a picture of what's going on out there. Um, our kids have really significant needs. No one's doing anything about the growing poverty in Chicago, okay? It's just getting worse and worse. There's no jobs coming in. There's no opportunities for people. Um, and so the idea of giving these students the very least prepared teachers that we have out there, to me, is an absolute criminal offense. Um, if you get nothing else from today's panel, I want you to leave with this fact that TFA's model of preparation is so insufficient that the novices in Chicago have had between 15 and 20 hours total working in front of students before they're set alone in their own classroom on day one, okay? 15 to 20 hours of actually standing in front of the class teaching, all right? Um, I was uh, getting my hair done the other day and my stylist was telling me how in the state of Illinois, you are required to have 1,500 hours of practical experience before you could ever practice alone. And to me, the idea that we would let um, anybody stand in front of our high need students without proper preparation is just wrong. It's just wrong. Um, TFA ends up exacerbating one of the greatest inequalities we have in education today, which is that our low income students, primarily students of color, are given the least prepared and least experienced teachers. Okay, it just exacerbates that problem. They didn't create that problem, but they exacerbate it, they make it worse. Um, the other piece of it, I think, that is just so important is, um, and I think Josh actually brought this up when he talked about his own story, is that he knew he wanted to go either, you know, stay teaching in the classroom or go into education reform. And what we're talking about when we're saying education reform is there is a, a, a movement out there going on, and I hope that you all pre-service teachers are learning about this in your classroom, about what's going on out there in terms of the education landscape. Um, we have something called the Corporate Education Reform Movement. Um, at least that's what uh, people like me um, define it as. I'm sure other people would say differently. Um, and what we're talking about is a movement that is coming in and closing down public neighborhood community schools replacing them with privately managed charter schools, um, replacing, we're talking about um, our labor force in Chicago has gotten significantly younger and significantly wider over the past 20 years of these reforms. Um, the first reform laws went into effect in 1995. In 2002, when Arne Duncan came to Chicago, and I am gonna be speaking a lot on Chicago because that's where I, I am. Um, so a lot of my examples are coming from this, but um, I also wanna make clear that what I'm talking about in Chicago is actually happening in a lot of other places. So um, what we see is uh, when Arnie Duncan came into Chicago in 2002, he brought in a program called Renaissance 2010. This, pro this program's goal was to shut down 100 neighborhood schools and replace them with um, charter schools, turnaround schools, which is where you come in, you fire up to, uh, from a half, at least one half up to all of the staff and replace them with new teachers um, or different teachers, let me say that. And, um, and that goes down straight down to the lunch ladies, like everyone gets fired in a turnaround, okay? Um, and contract schools. So this is a, a, a national model now, thanks to Arne Duncan going on to our, our Department of Education. I'm sorry about that, that was Chicago, I apologize. Um, so we're, what we're seeing is this mass disruption in our education system. All right. Um, in Chicago, uh, last year, I, wanted, I, I, I wonder how many people here in Champaign kind of heard about what was, what's been going on in Chicago and cities like Chicago. Um, last year alone, we saw the closing of 50 neighborhood schools, 50 schools. Have you guys heard about this? Is this something you guys are talking about? Good. Okay, I see a lot of nodding heads. This was such, I, I was there for this entire battle 
it was the most heart-wrenching thing you can imagine. I mean, they had hundreds of hearings where parents and teachers and students would come out and say, please do not close down my school. Please, we, we know that we have problems in our schools. We know that. Give us resources. Help us. We'll make it better. All right? And it was again and again and again, and this is what we heard. And despite all that, they came in and closed 50 more schools on top of those 100 schools that were already closed through RIN 2010. All right? So that's the, that's the first context, closing down schools. All those teachers fired, all that staff displaced. Um, some got rehired, some did not. Um, on top of that, in Chicago, we, that very same year, they had mass um, layoffs. So what we saw was, in total, about 3,000 staff lost their job, including about 1,000 educators. Um, this was last year alone. Um, and on top of all this, they cut the budget for our neighborhood schools. In schools like um, Kelly High School on Chicago Southwest side, they saw a cut of over $4 million for one high school in one year. So um, we're talking about 20 teacher positions lost. All right, this is the context. Within all this last year, last summer, Teach for America Chicago more than doubled their contract in terms of funding that was taken from the Chicago Public Schools. This is a school district that's telling us we don't have enough money to even keep these schools open, but we're gonna more than double the amount of money we're giving to Teach for America, all right? Now, Teach for America actually, um, in addition to requiring districts to pay the full like, salary and benefits of its members, it also charges finder's fees for most of its um, districts. So that's an additional, what, 2000 to seven, up to $7,000 fee per recruit. And he said there's over like 600 TFA members currently teaching, right? With over, I guess, what is it, 325 new recruits this year alone. So what you actually see is that you're charging these cash-strapped districts for your services, even though Chicago, and let's be real clear, we don't have a teacher shortage. We have laid off teachers looking for work, all right? So, um, I mean, this is the context that TFA comes in, and people are getting angry. When they hear these kind of things, when they hear TFA coming in and acting that way, I don't see there really being any other response but to say, what are you doing? What are you doing? We are struggling here in our communities, and you guys just come in and take this. You're taking this extra money, you're increasing the number of new recruits, so that those teachers that got displaced through all this chaos no longer um, cannot get those positions. All right? This is a guaranteed contractual agreement that they have with the Board of Education. Those TFAers, even if they themselves, some of them got laid off in this process, they themselves got rehired. All right? They were contractually obligated to rehire these teachers. All right? And this is happening in Philly. This is happening in Detroit. This is happening, we're seeing it right now in Newark, the exact same thing happening. Closing down neighborhood schools, displacing all those, um, those students, those communities, you know, disrupting those communities, replacing them with charter schools, um, and then TFA expanding and profiting off of this disaster capitalism. All right? Um, and that's what I also want to talk about, TFA's connection to the charter school movement. And this is a very important connection. Um, when they tell their stats about you know, what's going on out there, uh, a lot of the expansion that's taking place is, especially in a city like Chicago, is um, happening in our charter schools. All right, so, so oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so, um, and I want to also kind of give you an understanding of when he says he's create, they're, they're creating all these leaders, a lot of them are leaders in the charter school movement. This is a privatization movement. These charter schools, unfortunately, are, um, <coughs> Many of them practice what we call no excuses policies in their schools. Um, have you guys, are you familiar with the term no excuses at all? Okay, so it's, a, it's basically a policy, often a discipline academic retention policy that kind of is a strict punitive policy on our students, like where you get demerits and in trouble for not having the right color belt or not looking the teacher in the eye or slouching or, um, and I get kids from these schools in my hospital all the time. And these schools are so beating down our students' spirit because they're telling them again and again, there's something wrong with you. You're the problem. You are why you're not succeeding. You didn't have enough grit. Completely ignoring the poverty, completely ignoring the lack of resources. Our Chicago public schools are under-resourced ridiculously. That's a real problem. That's a real problem that is not being dealt with, all right? Um, 
we are in the state of Illinois. The state of Illinois has one of the most regressive school funding formulas in the entire United States. And what I mean by that is that schools that have the highest needs get the least money. That's how our system is set up here. All right, so if we want to talk about reform, that's a great place to start. Funding, that's the basic, that's the, you know, it's necessary but not sufficient for the real kind of change that we want. And I want to make it clear that I want real change. I believe that if TFA were to play a positive role in our communities, there are things they could do. Um, I think, for example, my idea is always giving their hardworking, wonderful recruits that really want to do, and I believe the people in TFA are good, you know, well-meaning people, that if they were to give us assistant teachers paid for out of TFA's coffer, I mean, TFA has cash. They got money, okay? They've amassed over $1 billion over the past five years in their entire national organization, okay? So um, they could be using that money instead of hiring all the MLP, I don't know, all their PD, whatever. Um, you know, they could be using it for other things. So I just want to encourage Teach for America to pay attention to what's happening out there and to change to meet communities and students' needs. Thank you. All right, so I'm just working. Thanks to the panelists for being here. Thanks to Dr. Lubienski for moderating. Thanks very much to Tiffany Puckett uh, for all of her help logistically. Um, so to talk a little bit about my personal experience with Teach for America, <clears throat> uh, I'll start with this. You know, TFA shapes policy and practice by holding itself up as an exemplar example for teacher preparation. And it's through my experience as a traditionally certified teacher and Teach for America core member that I ground my current research on TFA and the larger privatization movement. <clears throat> so let me expand a bit on my background. I, of course, going through college, had two years of general education, followed by two years of content, pedagogy, and methods courses. So that's teaching you how to teach, uh, then a full semester of student teaching. I graduated in the fall of 2007 with the intention of getting a job uh, during the summer of 2008. Uh, but if you recall, uh, the recession really kicked in in 2008. And so what we found as graduating teachers is that, particularly in the state of Georgia, uh, I can't say that every county instituted a hiring freeze, but you can pretty much say that the entire state um, enacted a hiring freeze because they could not afford to hire new teachers. The hiring freeze lasted from 2008 to 2010. I actually got a job as a substitute teacher. Um, starting in 2009, they lifted the ban for substitute teachers. I was thinking, well, hopefully when the hiring freeze lifts, I'll be able to uh, get a job. <clears throat> there was one interview that was, or one position that was open in 2010. The opening received over 300 applications within the first 72 hours. I'll say that again. 300 applications within the first 72 hours. It actually came down to me and another candidate. After going through three rounds of interviews with assistant principals, I finally got to interview with a principal who told me, look, I'd love to hire you, but I have a standing policy to not hire teachers who have not had at least a handful of years of experience to teach in my kind of school. Um, a, a side note, that same principal the very next year took eight new TFA teachers. It was the first time those core members went into Gwinnett County. So for me, that either showed a dramatic change in his policy of hiring people or perhaps an invisible hand at play. Um, after not getting that job, some, someone said to me, you should apply to Teach for America. And I said, well, what's Teach for America? I've never heard of him. They said, well, they'll get you a job. I said, hey, great, that's all I care about. So I did apply. And I did get in, but despite being certified and having a license in the state of Georgia to teach middle or high school history, I was brought on to teach elementary special education. Uh, I spent weeks during the Summer Institute advocating for myself for my position to be changed, only to have my commitment to closing the achievement gap question. Uh, close to the end of Institute, I was actually offered a job outside of Teach for America teaching middle school history. And after forming TFA of that job offer, I actually even said, why don't you consider this your placement in Gwinnett County uh, since you want to expand there. I received a phone call within 12 hours of informing TFA uh, that about switching my position, <clears throat> and they said, look, a job in Atlanta Public Schools has just come open at a high school teaching history. Would you like that? Which was interesting to me, having been on the job market for almost three years now, that within 12 hours, the job uh, magically came open. So something you should know, the very first day that I met my principal was the first day of pre-planning. He'd never seen my resume, didn't even know my name. I later found out that due to low, to low student population projections, uh, of the four social studies teachers at the high school, one of them was actually leveled. That means that there was no justification for having four social studies teachers, so they said we have to reduce it to three. 
that teacher was leveled the day before I showed up, making the count four again. So that extends my personal narrative, and I'd like to talk a bit about the research. So Teach for America's Institute, which is an insight that's been largely unknown to most researchers, uh, given that most research has been done from the outside in. There is, so during the five weeks, the first week, uh, there are times where core members are observing classrooms, but their lead teaching predominantly takes place in the last four weeks. In fact, they accumulate about 125 hours of session time, but something you should know, most of my research is uh, in the Atlanta Institute. The average time of teaching for the person teaching these core members is two and a half years. So that means someone's been in the classroom for two and a half years, they serve as the curriculum or literacy specialist teaching new teachers. Uh, as Katie said, uh, actually at the Atlanta Institute, core members receive about 16 to 18 hours of lead teaching. Uh, though the environment is not very realistic, in fact, the average classroom has about 10 students in it, uh, endless amounts of visitors. I worked as a school operations manager. My job was going into classrooms and videotaping core members. I'm sure you can imagine that having a video camera in the back of the room changes how students interact with their teachers. Of course, real-time coaches, TFA partners with Lee Cantor's assertive discipline program where uh, struggling core members are actually wired up with a radio, with an earpiece into their ear, with a real-time coach sitting in the back of the classroom, feeding them real-time information or intel about whether Johnny's paying attention, where to stand in the classroom, what to say. Uh, and uh, Katie mentioned this, but I'll, I'll mention it as well. And putting TFA's 145 hours of training into context, specifically here in Illinois, uh, she mentioned the barber or cosmetologist requires 1,500 hours of uh, training before you can become a licensed cosmetologist. That's 1,034% more than TFA. If you want to be a massage therapist, it requires 500 hours. If you want to be a licensed hair braider, it requires 300 hours. Right? So I submit to you that just simply attaching the word rigorous or intense to 145 hours does not make up for the fact that they receive over 1,000% less training. So TFA's theoretical framework, they largely operate off of what's known as the academic impact model. Uh, and it's really outlined with Stephen Farr's teachings of leadership among other documents within TFA. And essentially, the rhetoric goes like this. We've studied teaching. We have, they don't use the word recipe, but it's implied that we have the good recipe for teaching. And we know that at the base of all teaching are, are teachers' beliefs, mindsets, and skills. Those naturally inform teacher actions, which naturally inform student actions, which naturally informs student outcomes. So during Institute, when core members are being assessed and when they're in their two years of teaching, where they're being as uh, assessed, whether it be their core member advisor or their MTLD, they say, were your students successful, yes or no? If the answer is yes, we can celebrate you because you're at the foundation of that. If the answer is no, we know who's to blame, and that's you. In fact, it's so stressful that Teach for America contracts with a counseling hotline during Institute in case core members are feeling overstressed, thoughts of suicide, et cetera. Certainly, counseling services are not typically associated with traditional uh, training programs. We've actually now, myself and a few other researchers, documented thoughts of suicide among core members, clinical depression requiring heavy doses of medication or resulting in the core member quitting. So that's the theory and here's the practice. It reinforces the belief in a recipe for teaching, one that typically centers on teaching to tests, and that college leadership skills, so part of the um, application process, that college leadership skills naturally equate to teaching skills. It reinforces the fact that, at least in the Atlanta Institute, a full two-thirds of incoming core members last year had a bachelor's degree that does not support their content area that they were being placed. So you see a lot of journalism majors who are teaching, say, high school math. Right? So TFA, uh, they have a page on their website. Uh, I, I think it's called Results or something like that. Uh, Philip Kovacs, a, a good friend of mine, he's done an analysis of that page. In fact, of all of the studies that Teach for America promotes is, look how good we're doing, 59 have actually been classified as providing mixed or irrelevant results, 33% are completely irrelevant, and only 8% show positive results. But there's a caveat to the positive results. In fact, as Josh mentioned last year, Mathematica produced a study that indicated that high school TFA teachers in math outperformed their counterparts, which are their questions of sample um, uh, choices, that they added an additional 2.6 months of learning. But there's something you should know about those 2.6 months of learning. Translations into days of learning is done by a procedure that is never explained or discussed. The expression of differences in test scores in terms of days of learning requires accepting substantial untested assumptions about the nature of student attributes measured by state tests. So the difference between the two groups, 
was 0 0.01 standard deviations. So the TFA teachers versus the non-TFA teachers, 0 0.01 standard deviations. I'll break that down a bit for you. That indicates that a quarter of a hundredth of a percent, meaning 0 0.000025 of the variation can actually be explained. So that certainly paints a different picture than the use of extra days of learning or extra months of learning. So TFA's role uh, in the larger um, education reform realm, uh, essentially I think it's fair to say that Teach for America has effectively privatized teacher education into a fast track entry. So that is, if you want to be a journalism major but you want to be a teacher, there's no need to go through traditional training programs. There's no need to have uh, myself, I accrued over uh, 1,400 hours uh, of observations, classroom, uh, pedagogy methods classrooms and also my student teaching experience you don't need that we can fast track you into the uh, profession which of course imagine uh, physicians opening up their profession to people who want to get a fast track um, spot in the surgery room operating room uh, pro reform policymakers see teach for america as a way to save money on teacher pensions yes most districts pay a finder's fee for teach for america but in the long run, if you have people who are not staying and not committed to teaching, what you save on are pensions in retirement, right? In fact, the, the number, uh, I've seen lots of different estimates, but it is in the hundreds of millions of dollars nationwide that are being saved by having people think of teaching not as a profession, but rather as a temporary gig. Um, replacing public schools, uh, Katie talked about this with charter staffed uh, by Teach for America, in fact, nationwide. Uh, I know it's different in Chicago, but nationwide most charters don't allow unions, so it is a form of union busting. Replacing traditional teachers, um, again, Katie mentioned this in New Jersey just last week, I think it was last week, 700 teachers, oh, Newark, I'm sorry, uh, 700 teachers received pink slips. Uh, all the while, they also increased their contract with Teach for America to bring in more core members. There are massive amounts uh, of core members that are placed in special education. And what you should know about special education, uh, during the course of Teach for America's Institute, at least uh, from looking at the schedules from the Atlanta uh, Institute, again, I can't speak to Chicago's, if you are positioned or slated to teach special education, like I was at the time, you actually get two hours. You get a two-hour training session on what it means to be a special ed teacher, right? So Teach for America is massively changing what we consider the legality of special ed teachers. I, I think I would submit to you, I think you might agree with me, that in two hours time, you can't possibly learn enough about Asperger's syndrome, you can't possibly learn enough about Down syndrome, you can't possibly even begin to understand how to work through an IEP, for example. And the issue of having training, right, that, that they're constant training throughout the two years, that helps. In the Atlanta Public Schools where I taught, every single new teacher is given a coach. This is not associated with Teach for America. In fact, my coach, she had a caseload of eight, right? So it was myself and seven other teachers that she helped. She was in my classroom at least twice a week, not associated with Teach for America. So this idea of ongoing training and support is not something limited or exclusive to Teach for America. Of course, Teach for America is bankrolled by the Walton Foundation. Uh, you know, as a company, and this is my personal opinion, a company of, like Walmart that makes so much of its money based on inequity, I, th I think it quite... Um, curious that they would try to use that money to end the same inequity that provides them with workers and consumers. They're changing the way we hire teachers. Of course, MOUs, here's an MOU from Oakland uh, in which they outlined that the Oakland Unified School District will place 43 Teach for America teachers total. Quote, specifically, the district will reserve positions for seven math teachers and so on and so forth. So they're changing how teachers get hired. And further, TFA is shaping policy, uh, shaping reform policies by facilitating the political careers of its alums via its spinoff arm of Lee. So many who are saying, so in fact, many who are staying in education are folks who actually work for privatization organizations. I myself respond to the alumni survey every year. I'm considered staying in education. I don't think uh, it's in the same way that TFA would consider staying in education. But I do want to stress as I close, uh, I do believe that uh, uh, in fact, I know. Most of the core members that I've met, most of the people in Teach for America, they're really great people. They're well-intentioned. They're some of the most fantastically motivated people I've ever met. And that my critique of Teach for America should not be seen as an endorsement for the status quo of how we prepare teachers and how we look at the teaching profession. But I will certainly say that if a ship is moving in one direction, you have to slow it down and turn it around before you can start having alternative uh, conversations. So, thank you. Thank you to the panelists. <coughs> um.
I do want to reserve time at the end for your questions, and we've already gotten some um, good questions submitted, so we will get to that. But I, as I said, I wanted to um, set aside some time right now to give each panelist the opportunity to respond to the things that were said. So what I propose we do is that we'll go in the same order, and I'll, um, I'll give each person, say, three minutes to, to raise questions, respond. And then if you want to ask other panelists questions, that's fine. I won't count their response against your three minutes, but I do ask you to keep your responses brief just so we can get to the audience's questions as well. So if that's okay with you, Josh, we'd start with you. Sure. Yeah, Thank thanks. you. Um, okay. So a few notes. Um, first, uh, let's just talk about how uh, hiring works in the city of Chicago, because uh, I think there's uh, it's just helpful to actually understand this and level set on the facts. Um, so Katie mentioned we have a contract with CPS. I want to explain very clearly how this contract works. First of all, it didn't double last year. Uh, it went from 1.2 million the previous, uh, previous year to 1.6 million. Um, but the way it works is we do get uh, sort of a $2,000 per recruit fee for everyone that ends up getting hired in CPS. But we are not, and I want to say very, very, very clearly, we are not guaranteed those positions, right? Our people have to get hired by principals. Uh, so if you actually want to think about that for a second, actually, like, CPS, once they link into this contract with us, they actually have a, you know, essentially a financial disincentive uh, for our people to get placed. Um, so absolutely, positively, there is no obligation for them to place our people. Okay, I want to make that un abundantly clear. Second, um, hiring in the city of Chicago, whether it's in charter schools or traditional schools, is principal-led, principal-driven, as I believe it should be. Uh, so no Teach for America teacher, no new teacher, no veteran teacher gets hired into a school unless the principal actually selects that candidate from a group of candidates, I mean, selects that person for the job among the group of candidates that are out there. Um, so we actually think of it as a very healthy signal um, that basically uh, principals are um, actually in a very uh, competitive hiring market um, selecting our candidates. Um, we it suggests that they think they do a pretty good job. Um, I also want to make the point that last year in the city of Chicago, yes, there were lots of teachers laid off. I want to bring you back to the summer of 2010. All of our teachers, not, or sorry, I shouldn't say all, 95% of our teachers who were teaching in traditional district operated schools were laid off in the summer of 2010. Um, so basically, we are not immune to this, as Katie alluded to, um, at all. Um, but even last summer, where there were all these budget cuts, which led to the reductions in force, um, there were something on the order of 2,000 new teachers hired in the city of Chicago. Um, and something like 20,000 people applied for those jobs. Um, so we're applying for and competing for those jobs alongside others. Um, so it is a principle-driven process. The contract does not in any way, shape, or form obligate CPS to hire our people. That's one point. Second point. Um, you heard, um, I think what is common in these kinds of conversations, um, it, which is a fixation with the inputs, um, and the inputs of how short the training is, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, I just want to bring you back to sort of three key things we're doing that are leading to student outcomes. First, selection. Um, so I want to talk about, and we should have a real conversation about the rigor of selection process uh, for schools of education, for Teach for America, for any teacher preparation program. Because uh, it's not like it's an easy thing to get into Teach for America. Uh, you know, the average GPA of our people is a 3.8. 95% uh, of the people who come into Teach for America have held a substantial leadership role on their college campus and so on and so forth. So we're bringing in real, you know, really great leadership talent. Um, so selection intensiveness of the training. And I will say, uh, I would be the first to acknowledge, I don't think our train, I think there are major ways in which we can improve our training. We're really excited in the city of Chicago this summer, we're running our own training institute, right? So this is a move within the organization. Regions will begin running their own uh, training uh, institutes if they opt to do that. Uh, our training institute this summer will be a little bit longer and it'll look a lot different than it has historically. Um, and then, um, the third thing we're doing is the intensive support. I, I should have put this in historical context. Uh, you know, Teach for America has been around for 25 years, uh, but when I entered the Corps 10 years ago, uh, the ratio of support was one uh, program director or coach, now we call them the MTLD, the Manager of Teacher Leadership Development, that's the role I referred to earlier, one of those guys for every 75 Corps members. And today in Chicago it's one to 18, and that's an investment we decided to make locally. Um, and that's what's leading to good results. Um, and I do want to just say really clearly, 
Um, the evidence on, like my best understanding of the external evidence on Teach for America when you look at the studies that do the right sampling method and so on and so forth, is that basically you see uh, a sort of s somewhat uh, limited net positive impact uh, on student achievement versus other teachers in the same context. What's really exciting to me is as a result of lots of hard work, um, you've seen um, really substantial gains and really uh, terrific progress in Chicago, and we know that by looking at NWA and ACT growth data. Um, so anyway, I, but I would bring you back uh, to the inputs versus outcomes conversation. I think that's really important, and it often gets lost, because uh, we the, all these analogies to the medical profession and so on and so forth will be marshaled, but let's look, if we're going to have that conversation, let, let's look at the full duration uh, or the full suite or continuum of the practices that are in place in getting one ready to be a doctor or getting one ready to be a lawyer or getting one ready to be whatever, um, let's ask the question, is that the right analogy for our sector? And then what parts of the model can we learn from? Um, there's a little bit of a chairing picking of this analogy that goes on. Um, John, can I keep Josh, going? Can, I, can uh, I cut you off because we do want to the others? And there are some questions for you, so you will have a chance to speak. Okay, good. Is that okay? Thank you. Stephanie. Sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight a couple things, and I really enjoyed listening to everybody's um, perspective. You know, Josh highlighted just the intensive amount of support that Teach for America teachers receive. And again, like, I just, that's, that's what I want to highlight. Again, like, through my experience um, describing to you all the type of support that I received, yes, from my district, but definitely from Teach for America, that was, you know, a very positive quality for me and, and my experience in Phoenix. Um, and just along those lines, I definitely consider Teach for America to be a regional organization. Um, I share with you my experiences in Phoenix, um, and I realize that it, it, may, it may not be typical um, and, and consistent across regions across the United States. Um, so that's just, that's, that's what I would like to highlight. Okay, um, I guess there's two things I wanna kinda hit upon. Um, first of all, is this uh, kind of, talking about well, student outcomes, um, this idea. I wanna highlight what we're talking about here is standardized test scores. And I hope that you guys, pre-service teachers especially, have an understanding of what standardized test scores are, what their history is. Um, standardized test scores, IQ test, all these things, actually um, were come originally from the eugenics movement. So we're talking about highly biased, tests that are norm reference. Norm reference means that it is on purpose a bell curve, which means you're gonna have high scores and low scores. If, the, if everybody passes a question, then they throw that question out because they didn't get their bell curve. Okay, so this is designed to tell a certain population of our kids that they're failing or they're behind or they're not doing well, okay? That's what they're talking about with student outcomes. I'd love to have a conversation about real student outcomes in terms of you know, critical thinking, which you, got, you brought up earlier and I think is incredibly important. Are our students out there, are they active in their communities? Are they making a change? Are they, um, you know, I don't, honestly, I could care less about what their NEWA score was or the ACT score, honestly. Um, we need to move away from this kind of um, education for our students because it's, it's, it's racist and it is um, classist and we need to stop treating our kids like they're numbers. Um, the other thing is, um, I do want to talk about, I guess, how Teach for America has kind of warped teacher preparation, which I think Jameson alluded to a little bit. Um, a few years ago, the Teach for America organization actually went to Congress, lobbied our federal laws to change the No Child Left Behind Act, which said in that law that um, districts needed to identify uh, how many of their teachers were highly qualified and to inform parents if their student, if their child's teacher was not yet fully prepared. This was something that was one of the only good things that was in this law, okay? Teach for America went into Congress, lobbied, and had that changed um, so that included the words teachers in training. So now, if you're enrolled in a program, you go to night school, you do your grad school at night, you're considered highly qualified. Parents are not informed. You, your child with special needs, if that teacher has only had the you know, institute, they're still, and, you know, and these, the TFA teachers have to go to school at night. They have to do their entire graduate program that you all are doing right now. They have to do all of that at night while they're teaching their first year, okay? Um, so, I mean, and this had a huge impact. We're seeing a, an explosion, a proliferation of fast track programs. We're seeing a proliferation of these um, really pedagogically um, empty and vapid 
um, programs that get there really are about moving test scores, moving test scores, moving test scores. We're not talking critical pedagogy. We're not talking, you know, anti-racist um, uh, teaching. We're not talking about activism. So, um, am, am I out of time? <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to like, kind of touch upon the impact of TFA. Just it, it ripples out in so many ways that is damaging to communities and to our students. And I just we have to focus on that. Um, <clears throat> so just to pick up. From Katie's point, again, I, I really can't speak from a lot of intelligence about Chicago, but just thinking about uh, Atlanta. So the state of Georgia provides a provisionally or, or alternatively certified teachers a provisional certificate. In fact, my wife is a, a middle school math teacher. Uh, she's uh, alternatively certified, uh, which means uh, that for her first two years of teaching while she was taking her courses, she actually received, I think, 94% of a full salary. Uh, in Georgia, if you're a Teach for America, on an alternative or provisional certificate, you actually receive 100%. Uh, so th that's a little caveat. Uh, but because the provisional certificate is good for three years, and most court members do stay for two, in fact, most of the court members in Atlanta uh, were actually not taking courses at Georgia State, which was the partner program. So the only training that they had had was their five weeks of training. They were not enrolled in any type of program. Of course, that's Georgia specific. Um, so in, in the, the question of inputs versus outputs, I, th I think the previous Mathematica study, I think maybe 2007 or 8. 2004, uh, yeah. 2004, okay, thank you. Um, it, it predominantly showed that Teach for America uh, core members uh, very minimally edged out uh, math, uh, their counterpoints in math. But again, it should be noted that like the, the most recent Mathematica study focused on the high school math teachers. The majority of, nationally speaking, core members are not placed in teaching high school math. But something that's other interesting, another interesting fact is that if the outputs, if the outputs are very marginally different, in fact, in reading, actually a little bit lower, but what you should understand about the comparison group, the comparison group in that study were predominantly other emergency certified teachers. So I think that does, again, raise the question of inputs as well, that if other emergency certified teachers were able to just barely outperform TFA in reading, barely underperform in math, then it, it challenges the notion of Teach for America's training method, that if you don't even need that, if you can just be emergency certified, then you could do about the same. Um, I think that financial or districts do have a financial incentive to hire Teach for America teachers to pay for the finder's fee because uh, it's $2,000 in the case of Chicago versus decades of matching uh, retirement uh, savings. So there is a, a long-term financial uh, incentive. And I do have just a, a brief question. You mentioned that um, in the summer of 2010, about 95% of core members were laid off. Do you know how many of them were rehired the immediate fall? They were all rehired, but none or very few in district-operated schools. So charters? Yeah. But all of them were rehired? Well, because we, we basically make that commitment to our people uh, that we're going to work with them to find, uh, find a teaching job. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, am I allowed to add something? Or? Yeah, f feel free. We, we have uh, about 20 minutes. Uh, there are some questions, but if you ha feel free to follow up right well, now. Well, just uh, one thing, well, it could take us down a, a, a longer conversation, but I'll say it if that's okay. Uh, I, I do think um, this whole notion, I, I think it's just interesting and for people who are um, either considering a, a career in the education sector uh, or just are engaged and interested citizens, um, it's probably worth just understanding and just saying a little bit more about what we meet, what, what people are saying when they're talking about this effort to privatize public education. Um, they're, they're, I think, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to describe it and sort of, again, level set on some fundamental terms because I think it's important. Um, that's what they're mainly referring to is this idea, as Katie talked about, of charter schools, uh, the increased number of charter schools and the increased number of students going to charter schools uh, within uh, districts. Um, just, it's important to just know what, I often find that people don't even know, like literally the definition of a charter school. So a, a charter school is, here's what it is. Um, it is a, you know, it, they're mostly nonprofit. Some of them are for profit, but in the city of Chicago, the vast, vast majority are nonprofit organizations. Um, the, where basically there's there's three ideas at play. The first is that the parents uh, of the kids um, decide where the kid's going to go to school, and then the money that the school system spends on that kid's education follows the parents um, and goes then to the school they decide to enroll their kids in. So the first element of the model is parents being empowered through choice. Um, 
The second part of the model is that the educators closest to the kids are given the freedom or the empowerment or the autonomy to make the key decisions about how the education plays out so as to meet the needs of the kids coming in their door. Um, so, for example, what that means is they get to decide how long the school day is, they get to decide personnel, so who's hired, uh, you know, sort of what, what it's going to take to get promoted and so on and so forth, and they get to decide sort of how the money is spent. Um, so basically they take that allocation, that per pupil allocation uh, from the district and decide sort of how it's applied. Um, and then the third part of the charter model is that in exchange for the educators getting this autonomy, they are accountable for the results. In the, in the school. Um, and so basically, they're, in order to keep their license, or keep their charter, in other words, uh, they have to deliver strong results. And so their contract in Chicago, for example, comes up every four years. Um, and I want to just say really clearly, there are great charter schools, there are bad charter schools. There are like something like 110 charter school campuses in the city of Chicago serving about 55,000 kids. There are great charter schools, there are good charter schools, there are decent charter schools, and there are bad charter schools. Um, and the point if, of this is, just giving people freedom to run a school as they see fit doesn't necessarily guarantee they're going to do a great job with that freedom, is one point. The other point, though, is that um, there needs to be a little bit more rigor or uh, uh, integrity in the authorizing process in making sure we do pull the license uh, when a school doesn't succeed. But underlying all of this uh, is the fact that the, the kids land there uh, because the parents have sort of said something they're saying something somewhat clear, which is, um, I want to try something different for my child versus the education they've been getting. Um, and so that's what's described as the effort to privatize public education. I want to say one other thing about the enrollment practices, um, which is basically the charter schools aren't allowed to like take things like your test scores, your socioeconomic status, uh, et cetera, into, into consideration. They literally have to take the kids that come to them. Um, and if they have more kids or more families that enroll kids than they have, stu that, than they have seats, that, sorry, they have to do a blind lottery. Um, and so it is in this respect, where oftentimes you'll hear people when, in response to this critique, they'll say, hold on a second, charter schools are public schools. They're public schools in the sense that they are publicly funded, they are free, open enrollment schools. Um, and so anyway, I just wanted to level set on those terms. Uh, we can debate about sort of the relative merits and, and sort of impacts of the charter sector, but those are just sort of basic facts about how the, the sector is set up. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think the discussions of public, what, what do we mean by public schools and is this a, a privatization movement? Those are really interesting. They move us a little bit off topic. So um, I'd encourage people to take that up afterwards, but I, I do want to keep us focused on um, Teach for America. And in that regard, and, and following up on the charter school issue, we have a question from a local um, uh, school board member who says public education is a public good, one that's supposedly by, by all taxpayer, uh, that is supported by all taxpayers and available to all children for the benefit of society. How does TFA justify its uh, alliance with charter schools, many of which are run for profit? and which on average perform no better or worse than the public schools they often displace. So um, I think that the question is getting about political uh, allegiances between TFA and the charter school movement and also the, the question of um, academic performance. Then anybody here be free to respond? Well, I, th I think that, um, at least for me, and not so much focusing on the performance, I, I think there was a question, a part of the initial question was that um, public education is a fundamental cornerstone in our democracy. And of course, we know that charters by law are not allowed to screen applicants. We do have instances where that has happened. Uh, more importantly, we find that most charter schools practices, particularly uh, KIPP, for example, uh, they counsel students out. In fact, I think the study was done in San Francisco. Something like uh, only 30 to 40 percent of their initial students coming into their program uh, made it through to the end. Right, so they have a huge turnover rate. Uh, but something that's also considered this concept that public schools take everyone, every student that comes to them. That is true. Public schools, because they're a de democratic institution, they take and educate everybody. Most charter schools have very limited to no special ed services, meaning that they, they're not teaching special ed students. They have very limited to no English language learning. So you hear a lot of this of, look at the results of charters. Even if they're on par with public schools, they do it cheaper. Well. On the face of it, they look like they're doing it cheaper because they're not paying for special ed teachers, they're not paying for uh, services for English language learners. So for me, I think it's a, a theoretical uh, problem that I have with, with charters and, and the larger privatization movement, vouchers, things like that, is 
it, it really challenges this idea that schools are a democratic institution for our society. Any other responses to that? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Um, I do want to speak to this idea because this comes up a lot about parent choice, principal choice, this kind of thing. I just want to speak to ha what false choices we're talking about. Um, in the city of Chicago, um, people are saying, well, more people are enrolling in charters. Well, you're closing all their other schools. And on top of that, you're defunding the schools that are left behind, the community schools that are left behind. Are, I mean, these schools don't have toilet paper. These schools don't have a librarian or a library. Like, there's no books in the school. Like, if, you know, what kind of choice is it when you're saying, here, you could have this school that we're purposefully defunding, or you could have this shiny new charter um, that, by the way, is going to practice really oppressive discipline on your child. They are going to use very test-centric curriculum um, and focus, I mean, at our Noble Street Charter Schools, which is like kind of the flagship charters in Chicago, they, um, when I talk to kids from these schools, I ask them, how are you doing in school? They give me a test score. They actually give me a number when I ask them, how are you doing in school? They don't say, oh, I'm enjoying it. Oh, I'm having trouble. Oh, math is hard for me. They give me numbers. And it's so drilled into their heads that this is what teaching, this is what learning is. Um, so I, I want to speak to that. And I also want to speak about the fact that the district is not allowing the choice of choosing your neighborhood school anymore. They're not giving parents that choice. So it is a false choice when um, parents are coming out by the tens of thousands to hearings and saying, do not close my school. Do not close my school, please. This is my community school. And it also speaks to the democratic participation. Um, charter schools do not have, uh, in Chicago we have something called local school councils where um, six parents from the school, two community leaders, two teachers, and one um, non uh, teaching staff as well as a principal and in high school one of the a student also is a member of these bodies that can make decisions about their school charter schools do not have this intentionally there is no democratic way to participate in your schools other than saying I want to take my child out when something bad happens parents have no say in the discipline they have no say in that longer day it's decided by a board usually a corporate board so um, I want to speak to that and I just also um, well I will I'll let you guys um, I just also wanted, I'm sorry, one last thing, to speak about how the, um, the choice model actually creates competition for children, creating this uh, place where ch uh, schools are actually competing for the like, assets in terms of which child is going to raise my test score so I don't get closed down, so I get more funding, um, and turning some of our kids into liabilities. Our children are being treated like they're a liability, and these children are getting forced out of um, schools that can force them out. Charters are able to force out students. We just had a study out that showed the expulsion rate was something 10 times the rate of um, the neighborhood public schools, okay? That's because they can do it. Um, and that doesn't even include students that are encouraged to leave or that are told, if you don't leave, we're gonna make you repeat your freshman year again and again and again until you just get the, get the message and leave and go back to your neighborhood school. So we see these huge attrition rates and these policies are just, they're, I'm meeting all these kids that are so depressed and so anxious and, and, and literally suicidal over these policies. So I want to really give it that human face too. This is damaging to children and that's why it needs to be stopped. Um, so I'll, I'd love to respond to the initial question. Um, so uh, I think it was how do we justify our partnership with charter schools. Uh, we do think of charter schools as public schools um, and we, are, we, we work with and partner with schools uh, where the principal uh, uh, wants to work with us um, and so that's sort of how that's how we think about it um, in terms of our basic relationship in, as a placement partner for new teachers that's a very basic answer to your question I want to pose a few questions these can be rhetorical or, or folks can respond to them um, number one how is it that we went from zero to 55,000 students in the city of Chicago in charter schools over the last decade or the last 12 13 years um, how did those kids end up there and what's that telling us one question Two, uh, just specifically on the question of Noble Street. Uh, we are very proud of our partnership with Noble Street Charter Schools. Uh, eight of the 14 Noble Street campuses are led by Teach for America alumni principals. Uh, a large number of their teachers are core members, but more so actually TFA alumni. We're very proud of that partnership. Um, and uh, so basically, I just would I pose the question. Uh, first of all, the, the, the thoughts around the expulsion rate um, I, I, are just, I think, a little bit that, that that's a statistic that ought to be put in context. Noble Street expels essentially one out of 100 kids uh, that go to their school. Um, but two, just I'd love to just hear the thought, and, and really this is an earnest question. 
How do you think about um, Noble Street? I think they'd be the first to acknowledge. I, as one of their strong partners, would, would also say they're not a perfect organization. Uh, they do a lot of things right, and they're getting better at other things. Uh, they're a learning organization. They are very reflective, and they very, are very hardworking. But here's what you see. I mean, so one thing you find is that um, you know, while they're not perfect, if you look at the kids who start with them in ninth grade, who eight, nine years later have graduated from a four-year college, that number is five, six, seven times, uh, you know, so at least 5x what the district rate is. Rate is. Um, so meaning, so they're actually very meaningfully impacting or shifting long-term longitudinal outcomes for students uh, in terms of the percentage, right? So they're like basically of the ninth graders that start with them, my understanding is essentially 40 or so percent are graduating from a four-year college by, you know, eight, nine years later. Um, that's far from what we want it to be, to, be, to acknowledge. Uh, but again, we're working in a context where 8% of our kids overall are graduating from a four-year college, and that number drops to 6, uh, six or 5% for our low-income students in the city of Chicago. Um, so what meaning do we make of that result? Um, and then I do want to just correct the, like, so Noble Street's a great example. If you look at their, uh, I think the overall population, you may know this stat better than me um, as a special educator in Chicago, uh, but I think overall the percentage of students in CP that are um, special education students is about 16 or 17 percent. Is that accurate? That's about right, yeah. yeah. So Noble Street has it's 17 percent of their of their students are special education students. Um, and I will say that's not even necessarily across all the charter networks. I don't know what it is. I think overall it's like 14, 15 percent of charter school students in the whole city are special education students. Um, but what I have found is the stronger networks with a real commitment uh, to students are actually serving, um, you know, percentages of students on par with, uh, percentage of special education students on par with the district in aggregate, which is what you'd want to see. I'm going to, so, I'm going to exercise my moderator prerogative and, and, and treat those as rhetorical questions, okay. um, unless one of you had a response in the context of TFA. Otherwise, I'd like to bring the, co uh, the conversation back to TFA. Okay, there was a, another question. Um, what is the philosophical, educational, or pedagogical background um, that mentor teachers and instructional coaches share with first and second year teachers, and what's the research base for that? Can you repeat? Are, sorry, yeah. before you I think they're asking what what is how does research inform the the training that uh, and and the mentoring that um, TFA people get? So, uh, just speaking from some of my research uh, from the Atlanta Institute, uh, which the last I was there, they were um, uh, training. Obviously, the Atlanta Institute, the Memphis Institute, the New Orleans Institute. It maybe has changed uh, in the last year. Uh, actually, the year that I came in as a, a core member, they were training seven regions, including Hawaii, uh, because a lot of the assumption is that you know uh, teaching students in Atlanta will be exactly the same as teaching students in Hawaii. Um, but uh, from my research, uh, the year that I conducted it there, the 2011 Institute, the average trainer, uh, so core member advisor, curriculum specialist, literacy, literacy specialist, had two and a half years on average of classroom teaching time. Um, so I, I think that it does say a lot about the, the ongoing support that Teach for America teachers get, or core members get, uh, if those people who are supporting them have very little training themselves. In fact, uh, you know, as I said, er, stated earlier, two-thirds of core members in the Atlanta region, or at the Atlanta Institute, were scheduled to teach in a content area outside of something that would be commonsensically supported by their bachelor degree. Uh, so it would not be very unreasonable to have uh, a trainer, whether they be an MTLD or somebody at Institute uh, who has, you know, say two years of experience, who has a background, uh, again, in journalism, uh, who taught math, but now they're supporting science teachers, right? So I, I think it's, it's really challenging when you consider um, that yeah. mentorship model. And I, I would just like Go to ahead. share in, in Phoenix, and I don't know if this is atypical, but um, just thinking about the inst when I was in partnership with Teach for America running summer school, when I think about one of our curriculum specialists, she um, came from our district. She was in the classroom for something like 10 years, and she went on to become my district's um, language um, acquisition specialist. And so somebody with a wealth of knowledge and experiences now um, who works in the district, who is now tr the curriculum specialist training incoming core members, I couldn't think of somebody better to do that job. When I think of previous school directors um, who we were in partnership with, one of which um, was an assistant principal in, in Colorado, so somebody who had rich administrative experiences and classroom experiences, um, and the most recent, um, the, the last school director, somebody who uh, worked at ASU for their teacher preparation program. So um, just, 
just wanted to share those examples with you. Yeah, I just want to, so it sounds like there are two parts to the question, which is one, what are the background of the people who uh, do the support, the training and support of our teachers, and then second, what's the sort of philosophy or research base that informs our approach? So on the first, um, so basically there are, for if you just do the math of what I shared earlier, there are like 32, 33 uh, folks on my team who are directly those teacher coaches, the MTLDs, that unwieldy title. Um, their backgrounds uh, vary. Um, they're almost all, uh, you know, the va all, all but one or two of them you know, came through Teach for America uh, as teachers. Um, for the most part, they've taught uh, three, four, five years. Uh, several have taught, you know, six, seven years. Uh, and then we do take some uh, who have only taught a couple years. Uh, so that, uh, the, the key distinguishing factor of all these folks is they are um, they're basically every year among our very, very, very best teachers. So uh, it's a pretty rare person at this point in time who's ready for that kind of coaching and support role after two years. Uh, so it's more the norm that people would have taught a few more years. So that's the who they are. Um, the what's the research base or what's the pedagogical approach? Uh, we call it, and, and um, Jameson alluded to this earlier, teaching as leadership or TAL. Um, and so it's a kind of a cool research base, I think, which is basically over the course of 15 plus years, uh, we've had student achievement data coming out of teachers' classrooms. Um, and we've sort of basically honed in on um, what you might call the sort of some profound bright spots, uh, which is basically and made the determination or made the decision to really spend substantial time understanding when a teacher achieves real breakthrough results with their kids, what is it that's going on? And to Katie's point, it's not just breakthrough results in terms of test scores. Uh, they're sort of, a, sort of one at an aggregate level, they can indicate where something kind of interesting is happening. But then when we talk about a bright spot, we're talking about not only are the test scores going way up, but the longitudinal outcomes, the sort of, the sort of mindsets, uh, the sense of self-efficacy the students possess, um, all these things are shifting as well. And we did this sort of bright spot analysis uh, over many years, and um, basically to figure out what is it uh, at the teacher level um, what kind of teacher ha habits, and then underlying that, what kind of teacher mindsets um, are leading to these breakthrough results. And, and the model we came up with is called teaching as leadership. And it's a simple idea, which is that uh, to le achieve breakthrough results in our context, just as in many contexts, re requires great leadership. And we define that as meaning a few things. One, really clear and compelling vision uh, for the destination, where kids should be by the end of the year and why that matters in their life trajectory. Two, um, a real culture of investment, shared investment and ownership of the learning goals so that kids and families alongside the teacher want to work really, really hard. Three, purposeful use of backwards planning. Uh, so basically, it's an it's a approach to planning that says you plan, uh, it comes out of sort of a philosophy or sort of a, a pedagogy from Grant Wiggins, um, but basically it's sort of, you start with the end in mind and work backwards from there. Fourth, it's about using data in a way that it's helpful to you and your students in improving your practice over the course of the year. There is, I think, one thing we might all agree on. Um, there's, uh, I personally believe, we may not agree on this, that the use of data in, in public education is a very healthy trend. However, I think oftentimes when it's used in ways um, that are, uh, when it's used without full understanding of why it's being used, oftentimes you see odd, uh, sort of redundant, confusing, stifling applications. Um, and so basically, so I think there's a lot of misuse of data going on in public education today too. Um, but we see data, uh, uh, teachers use data in an incredibly purposeful way. Um, and then fifth, there's sort of this emphasis on relentless pursuit, uh, meaning the teachers are just doggedly determined uh, to reflect, learn, improve all the time, uh, and do whatever it takes to meet the needs of their students. So oftentimes you find these teachers you know, holding their students after school to do tutoring sessions and so on and so forth, because what we recognize is uh, to reach these ambitious learning uh, and development goals by the end of the year takes more time than we actually have with our students. So that's the pedagogical basis. Uh, there are a number of other good questions we simply won't have time to get to because I know some of our panels have to get back to um, Chicago. Uh, but I would like to offer you each opportunity for any kind of closing comment. And please uh, do keep it brief, a minute or less, if there's any last word you wanted to say. Jameson, would you like to start? Yeah, so just thinking, excuse me, <coughs> thinking back uh, to the title of the panel, Teach for America's Role in Education Reform or something like that. Um, I, I think that TFA is um, very clearly uh, uh, even through disagreements on certain things, I think we can all agree that Teach for America has played uh, a, a dramatic role in shaping uh, the discourse around public education, the discourse around uh, reformation. Um, 
my issue, uh, again, uh, having been a traditionally certified teacher and also a core member, I think the direction that the larger privatization movement, and I, th and I include TFA as uh, either being directly associated with that or uh, uh, by extension associated with that, I think that it's going in the wrong direction. I think you will see, or we will see, uh, the continued deterioration of democratic schools uh, for profit. Uh, and I think that uh, just thinking about teacher professionalism, uh, what it means to be a profession, I think it, it's a, a tough sell uh, to say that uh, it, whatever the training may be, whatever the results uh, may or may not be, uh, that some type of private effort, some type of very minimal effort uh, adds any weight to the profession of teaching. In fact, it, it may uh, undermine that. So i um, finish with that. Stephanie, did you have any last minute comments? Oh, you did you want to share? Well, I, we'll, we'll go to you Okay. Next. Out of order. Um, <laughs> so again, I just want to stress that I like that I view Teach for America as a regional organization. I've shared with you uh, my experiences in Phoenix for six years, and again, I just want to stress um, my very positive experiences and the tremendous amount of support that I received from my district as well as Teach for America. Um, and I know that my experiences are not unique. Talking. Um, I'm still very well connected with other core members in the district, um, and and again, I know that my experiences my experience was not one isolated, unique experience in Phoenix, um, and and again, I just I thank you all for for attending. Thank you, Katie. Okay. Um, yeah, I suppose I want to end with just first of all, a request to Teach for America and people within it. I ask for a greater um, transparency in your organization. It is extremely difficult to get any information on this. I do not know who where in Chicago TFA members are placed we do not know I mean this stuff is not they receive a lot of public funds both local state and um, federal level funds tax dollars um, and it's very difficult to find out information about the organization so I would really request just greater transparency I don't know how that would look but that is my first request um, and um, I do want to speak to kind of just the spin machine that is Teach for America and just to be it's very it's very frustrating working, like having these conversations because, you know, for example, the example about Noble Street and their special education, you know, I, I actually work with those kids. Um, they're not the same population of kids. It's, we're talking mild disabilities, we're talking, you know, learning disabilities that can be um, helped within the mainstream classroom. Um, I don't think Noble Street, to my knowledge, has a self contained classroom. I might be wrong on that. Um, but a lot of charter schools do not offer um, more. Um, uh, least restrictive environments in terms of like self-contained that kind of thing they don't have to um, the district provides it this those kids can go elsewhere according to their model so it's really not we're not talking about kids with the same disabilities and those numbers hide that um, so that's one thing and the last thing is there is a growing movement of people resisting this organization so I encourage everyone in this room to go out there and do research on this as college students, I want you guys to be out there telling the truth about what this organization is actually up to, its role in the corporate reform movement, um, how, what an inequality it is to give our neediest kids unprepared teachers. They're not ready. I'm sorry. Like, I, they might be improving their training a summer. I don't, it's not enough. It's just not enough. Um, we need to have a standard of, like, you have to have done this before you step into the classroom. So um, I encourage you guys to go out there, research it, and then speak up on your campuses because this is where they are getting all the people from. They're coming here, they're recruiting. Um, tell the truth about what's happening in this organization. Make, let's make it, um, I mean, the controversy is growing. Um, we just had a very successful trending, like resist TFA hashtag on Twitter. Um, go there, there's, I mean, this people are really angry about this organization and I, I want people to understand why. I want the organization to understand why and then to do something and change because they haven't. They haven't changed their model, um, despite even alumni coming out. I was just on a panel yesterday in Austin where five alumni just got up there and said, we want this to change, but they're not listening to us. So um, yeah, go out there, research, and be a voice of truth against what's going on. OK, thanks. Josh, yeah, let's, um, let's see. Um, so I, I don't have a ton to add. I, I guess I'd say one. Um, we're um, a learning organization. Um, and I hope what you've heard today from me uh, is that we're actually very eager to openly reflect on our practices. Um, and that's what we do. Um, and we actually evolve a great deal over time. Uh, and I often find a lot of critiques are actually rooted in pretty outdated understandings of our current practices. That's sort of one thought. 
Second, um, if you just look at our core purpose as an organization, I think we're actually um, making uh, not just a big impact, which we all agree, uh, but a, a very positive impact on public education in this country. Um, and uh, we're very proud of the core members and the work they're doing in their classrooms, uh, and very proud of the growing alumni base and all the work they're doing to innovate, push against boundaries within uh, the public education space. Um, and I suppose I might uh, just sort of uh, wrap up with a, a, so a, a question and a request going the other way, um, which is actually we do share a fair amount of information. Um, and um, the request I'd have is, uh, for my own experience when I was a teacher in New York City in a traditional public school, uh, to the experience I have now working in CPS for the last eight years, um, I would really like to understand the vision that we have for transforming our district operated schools. Um, because I think we all can agree, uh, we all said some version of this in our opening statement, the magnitude of change required is great. Uh, the urgency of the problem couldn't be greater. Um, and therefore, we should be talking about radical, profound, fundamental shifts in how we do things. Um, I find the charter sector interesting, exciting, because certain uh, sort of um, requirements or certain sort of boundaries put on uh, educators historically are removed so that they can really respond to the kids in front of them. Sometimes, uh, and in a lot of places, that goes really well. And of course, I, there are things I said earlier uh, about how I think the charter sector itself needs to evolve. Um, I'd love to understand how we're going to evolve our district-operated schools. Um, because it seems to me, and what I, I, what I haven't heard uh, from um, the, you know, the NPE crowd and others, is a clear, affirmative, uh, and substantial vision for reforming our district operated schools because I think you can, it's not a tenable claim to say that the way they're set up today is likely to succeed even if they have more resources. Um, and so I, I would love to understand that um, because uh, like, cause we are partners in this. We ought to be partners as opposed to in this polarized sort of state we're in today. Um, and yet I don't hear a ton of specificity, concreteness uh, coming from that side other than um, an ex in increase of resources, um, which I think taxpayers and I think a lot of people who've been in this space long enough uh, sort of realize, gosh, Yes, you know, we all agree resources are important, but within our current construct, uh, it's hard to see how that moves the needle. So that's where the closing thought I'd leave with. I want to thank um, the, the, the panelists and the organizers, Jameson and Tiffany, for putting this together. Um, the panelists in particular, uh, this is obviously an uh, issue that um, generates a lot of passion, so I appreciate you keeping things civil, and, and, uh, and this was, I think, a productive conversation. So please join me in, uh, in thanking the, pa the panelists.